okay with getting into um, some more of it. Just at the end of the last video, I was trying to remember the name of a book. It's this one. It's called Enthralled, uh, The Guru Cult <coughs> of Tibetan Buddhism um, by Christine A. Chandler. And it's a really good book. Um, she was she was kind of part of the Naropa Institute, Trungpa Rinpoche. And um, it, it, it's, it's a really good book. She goes into how she was into the whole thing, her and her partner, her husband. And then slowly they started breaking away from it. They started seeing all the, <clears throat> like a lot of the manipulation that was going on in, in this circle of people and all kinds of insane stories like people stealing money and... <clears throat> people having to do more and more of these courses and how corrupt things were and how it was slowly going out of control and um, lots of really insane stories and the kind of mind games that were, that were being played and it, when she was getting out of it, how people were shunning her and that, like the kind of cognitive dissonance that goes in um, with, with that kind of thing thinking that she was going crazy because everybody around her was telling her that there's, there's something wrong with you, there's something wrong with you, and, and, and questioning herself, like like, like questioning her, like the things that she could see. It's, um, it's a, a, a very, very good book. You can get that on Amazon. Um, it, it looks like a big, thick book, but you can, you can read this book in, in a couple of days, two or three days, because it's... It, 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 it really is um you just you just get right into it like like very soon i did anyway that's a really good book and just one other thing i was thinking before i started while well, i was talking about this little trick of people they say you need to calm down you need to calm down or um you're getting very angry just a little story in 1996 me and my ex-girlfriend we we went on holiday to egypt and um, we met this other couple out there, Paul and Paul and Annie. Um, they were from from Reading, and um, we ended up like travelling with them. And it was weird because they were actually sitting behind us on the plane to Egypt, but we didn't even like talk to them. Like, we, and we met them just briefly at the airport, and then we met them like three days later, and then ended up like going on this like spending two weeks together. It was strange. But um, waffling. So in Egypt, they're, they're they're quite aggressive when they try and sell you stuff like they like like uh, aggressive sales tactics. But they're very friendly as well because they want you to come in and sit down and drink tea and do all this stuff. And um, so it, it it happened often that you'd be walking down the street and they'd be like, ah, oh, my friend, my friend, come and sit down and ah, oh, look at t-shirt, look at this, look at that. And they do this little trick. You would be, you'd be like, no, no, I don't want anything. Like, and then, why do you get angry with me? Why do you get angry with me? And it was always like it, it, it puts you on the back foot. It's like, oh no, I've made him angry. And it, it's like a sales tactic. Like I was saying, like the psychologists do. It's a sales tactic to put you on the back foot and make you, make you think that you've done something wrong. Or there's something wrong with you, which is. It's, the end result is you end up buying something off them. And we were talking about this, I remember. And Paul, he was this funny guy. He used to work on building sites or construction. Big guy with like these kind of short but dreadlocks. And um, we were talking about this. A very funny guy. And um, he kind of picked up on this. And he would... He, he would... Any exchange you had, you'd walk in somewhere, like buy a cup of coffee or something, and the guy would come over and he'd say, all oh, right, what do you want? Oh, a cup of coffee and some of this and that. And they'd go, oh, yeah, a wave. And he'd say, why are you get angry with me? And they would be like, what, what? And he'd just come out with it. He'd hit them with it. And it was just, it was funny. They liked it. It was, you know, because they were good laugh Egyptians. And he would just, why are you get angry with me? And sometimes you'd be you'd just be walking down the street, and we'd be sitting there, and he'd call someone over. There'd, there'd be someone walking, like some old guy or some kid walking along, and he'd go, "Hey, hey, what, one minute, come, please, please, come here." And the the person would walk over, like, "What's what's this guy want?" And he'd walk over, and he'd say, "Yeah," and he'd say, "Why'd you get angry with me?" <laughs>
it was just other, it was funny at the time. Anyway, Co, let's get into this. Chapter 12 of A Planned Deception, Staging of a New Age Messiah. Were these Christians misunderstood? Perhaps the greatest source of criticism I received for the hidden dangers of the rainbow centred about my chapter, Deluded or Deceivers. There, I attempted to point out just a tiny sampling of what seemed to be blatant New Age propagandising of Christians. The criticism did not take me by surprise. I anticipated there would be a furore. I knew that these positions had not become entrenched philosophically and academically without having their defenders. Many people expressed surpri surprise that I had taken this stand. Why did I risk the unpleasant controversy? I felt for many reasons that this was perhaps the most important chapter within Hidden Dangers. My original intent in writing it was to show a little of the mounting evidence that the apostasy of Second Thessalonians was at hand. I entitled my original draft, Come Out of Her My People, The Growing Apostasy of American Religious Life. Little did I know at that stage of my writing that I was looking at anything larger. The subtler versions of this bothered me as much or more. It was those books I felt that would most likely reach evangelical Christians. There they would unknowingly receive occult goals. While the average Christian might see through We, We, We by Matthew Fox or When Gods Change by Charles McCoy, they might not appreciate that Ron Sider's books were taking them to the same political place. One of the primary aims of the movement was clearly a new world religion. Jesus said there would be deception enough to deceive even the elect. Thus, I felt it even more important to point out the subtle than the obvious. One reason I continued to press forward despite the controversy was that the average Christian was not acquainted with esoteric law. Certainly, before I began my investigation of this, I had been ignorant of it. Short of divine intervention, they are unlikely to know that perhaps some Sunday school materials are very much like those openly labelled New Age. I was also motivated by Jesus' instruction that there would be deception enough to deceive even the elect. Could Benjamin Crane deceive the average Christian? The chances are excellent that he could not. If he walked up to the average Joe or Mary Christian and said, follow me and my Maitreya the Christ, chances are excellent that they would tell him to get out of their face. However, if somebody would come along with the same political agenda as Benjamin Crane, as the evangelical books advocating the New World Order undisputably do, and said, praise the Lord, brother, do I love Jesus, and now in the name of Jesus, let's establish the new world order, and we will remember to give God all the glory. The average Christian, unless forewarned, might accept it. I had read the books and was familiar with the underlying literature that the Christian writers cited. I knew those references were not Christian. Therefore, if their authors had been bold enough to knowingly poison the Christian well, then I would be bold enough to point out the unchristian and even vitriolic, vitriolically anti-Christian nature of their sources. In some cases, I did not have the benefit of their bibliographies, but I felt it was stretching the limits of credibility to suggest that the blatant parallels to the New Age and humanist materials had been coincidental. This chapter will discuss some of those that I took the most fire for questioning. Ronald J. Sider After Sider and his friends in the Christian media claimed he had been misunderstood, Ron Sider prepared a revised and expanded edition of his InterVarsity published Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. Bono. Theoretically, 
he would have toned down any content that people felt could be construed as new age. Logically, he should have, because he knew there were those in agreement with my analysis of his work. This did not happen. Instead, the content of his revised and expanded version was unmistakably new age, both as to tone and recommended sources. The new rich Christians in an age of hunger endorsed the World Watch Institute, on page 232, headed by New Age and Humanist Manifesto signer Lester Brown, a Catholic New World Order-oriented group, Network, Lucis Trust, Planetary Initiative Cooperating Amnesty International, the National Council of Churches Church World Service, the Robert Mueller directed United Nations agencies, including the Food and Agricultural Organization, which calls for the creation of a World Food Authority. Yeah, that's coming. You could bet your bottom dollar that's coming. There's probably us here, basically. CESI, known as Publishes UN Development Forum for the Centre for Economic and Social Information. It publishes the UN Development Forum. And Gerard, Gerald and Patricia Mishi's pivotal New Age book, Towards a Human World Order. A work complete with everything, including the New World Order, the New World Religion, and on page 24, advocacy of a whole earth personal identity system. A whole earth personal identity system no the Mishi's book was published by Paulist Press in 1977 it is still in print the Mishi's could not be more active in the new age movement than they are they were one of five original sponsors of Planetary Initiative for the World We Choose. Mark Satin rates Toward a Human World Order as one of the 25 most important New Age books. It is certainly one of the most explicit. The reader might be interested in knowing also that Paulist Press and InterVarsity co-publish Ron Sider's books. Tom Sign. Tom Sign and publisher World Books have denied with equal vehemence any possibility of New Age influence. They point out proudly that he is the member of a Seattle Presbyterian congregation, University Presbyterian Church. The pastor of that church himself has been openly involved with New Age centres such as the Esalen Institute at Big Sur, California. Esalen proudly fosters witchcraft, spirit channeling, seminars are actually held with the nine, sexual looseness and nearly every other form of spiritual abomination. Esalen is absolutely no place for a Christian who wishes to remain a Christian. The fact that Sine, Sine willingly sits under a shepherd who himself has openly flaunted religious orthodoxy does little to convince me of Sine's orthodoxy. Sine has been published in New Age magazines. His article, Bringing Down the Final Curtain, appeared in the Utne Reader in fall of 1984. It originally appeared in Sojourners. It was a vicious att attack on fundamentalists who believed we were in the last days. He characterised those beliefs as dangerous. He said that the vision itself of an apocalyptic end was exactly the catalyst that could bring such an end about. He also said that God intends to bring into existence a new age of peace in which the weapons of warfare and violence are transformed into instruments of peace. Not surprisingly, this and other statements in his article received new age raves of approval. The Utne Reader is published by Eric Utne, the founder of New Age Journal. 
reading that article by sign, I was reminded of a passage in Peter. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. 2 Peter 3, 3-4, to four, King James. I spoke twice in the past year to a full gospel businessman's group at South Whidbey Island near Seattle. Both times there was heavy New Age attendance. <laughs> heavy New Age attendance there. Are. An island professional and his wife present at my April 1984 meeting questioned me closely. He said he was there representing world concern and was a friend of Tom Sines. When he asked me publicly what was wrong with Tom Sine and I gave my documentation, he grew strangely silent. His wife had earlier challenged a statement I made because she believed David Spangler to be an only child. After the evening's talk was over, I was besieged by FGBMF members who told me the couple had openly recommended David Spangler, Chinook Learning Community and Findihorn to their group. This combined with Sign's reference in The Mustard Seed Conspiracy to William Irwin Thompson's Evil and World Order, a book in essence about Findahorn and the New Age movement, convinces me that Sign is not and cannot be innocent of the New Age movement's existence. Since he said he is also a member of the World Future Society and is on a first name basis with William Irwin Thompson, Hazel Henderson, Willis Harmon and other New Ages of Distinction, again, and his books advocate their programmes. I fail to see just how he can plead innocence with a straight face. David Bryant David Bryant and his friends claimed I had misunderstood the intent of the first edition of Standing in the Gap, what it means to be a world Christian. Since I am not infallible, that remained a possibility. David Bryant has since twice revised his book and written another, Concerts of Prayer. It's getting very light. Concerts of Prayer. I've got the light on, but like, if, even if I open that curtain, it's still not light enough to read. Ah, where are we? Concerts of Prayer. As of the second revision of Standing in the Gap, I am convinced I did not mistake his intent. Most who follow the progress of the New World Order proponents are unfamiliar with the Centre for the Study of Democratic Institutions. It has drawn up proposed New World Constitutions and helped develop sophisticated rationales for scrapping the present nation-state system. Nevertheless, Bryant recommends them as resources for missionary trainees. So are the materials of the World Future Society and Amnesty International, organisations which last year held new group of world servers forums for Lucis Trust. World servers. I'm a world server. Tom Sines' The Mustard Seed Conspiracy, conspiracy <clears throat> and Ron Sider's Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger are recommended as well. The self-confessed New Age guru, John Naisbitt's Megatrends, was recommended as was the Aspen Institute's Daniel Yankelevich's book, New Rules, now part of the Bantam Books New Age series. Unfortunately, more than one evangelical has made this mistake. 
Even the National Council of Churches passed Bryant's scrutiny. I was surprised to note that Bryant had recommended the Pergamon Press, although it was misspelled Pergamon Press in Bryant's book. There was no mistake as to address the address. Maxwell House, Fairview Park, Elmsford, New York, 10524. This is a well-known New Age organisation and publishing house. Some of their published titles include Aurelio Pichai, founder, Club of Rome, The Human Quality. Okay, yeah, this is the guy, the Italian guy, founded the Club of Rome. Okay. Irvin Laszlo, The Inner Limits of Mankind. Heretical Reflections on Today's Values, Culture and Politics. Irvin Laszlo, The Objectives of the New International Economic Order. Eric Daman, The Future in Our Hands. Marilyn Ferguson said in her The Aquarian Conspiracy that this was one of the most important catalyzing books to European New Ages. An interesting comparison. In The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, I quoted a passage entitled A Parable from Bryant's book. That passage reads as follows. She's put a reference in there, but there's no reference. That parable reads as follows. A parable. Imagine for a moment that as long as you can remember, you've been seated in a darkened theatre alone. It's got caps in there. Well, not completely alone. You've noted other shadows brooding in the dimness. Some have even mumbled their names to you. But the chill, the mystery, the emptiness of perpetual night, that's been the extent of your life. Until now, that is. Imagine that one day a spotlight burst its brilliance across the distant stage. Light. At first, it startles you, then it intrigues you, you sit and stare. Gradually, your eyes focus. Now you're aware that a man has stepped into the spotlight. How unusual he is. He's laughing, dancing and singing. In time, you notice that others are up there too, <clears throat> dancing with the man in the light, happy and free, like he is. <clears throat> in the hidden dangers, <clears throat> I don't know if this is like the Maitreya they're talking about. In the hidden dangers, I had observed that the balance of the passage contained white light imagery and sounded far more like a Bhagwan Sri Ranjish talk to occult initiates than a serious call to potential Christian missionaries. However, even this seemingly harsh statement is far too mild. Nearly identical material appeared in Findy Horn's On Earth magazine, volume 2 of summer 1976. Written by English scientist slash occultist R. Ogilvy Crombie, it was dated well in advance of the 1979 publication of In the Gap. Crombie was a dedicated patron of the Findihorn Foundation. He thought he frequently communed with nature spirits. He certainly was communing with something! Exclamation mark. One day something introduced himself as the devil. 
in another conversation with this entity, who also called himself Pan, it said, <clears throat> here we go, all right, I'll do my best by an analogy. Imagine a theatre with a large stage. The stage is in darkness. It's the same fucking shit. The stage is in darkness. It is thronged with people, but you cannot see them because of the darkness, which symbolises your lack of sensitivity. Something wrong with you. Something wrong with you. A narrow beam spotlight picks out one of them and he immediately becomes visible to you. Any number of different individuals can be picked out and become visible in this way. Similarly, light could pick out a group or the whole stage could be lit. The light symbolises your heightened senses. It is a rough analogy, but it may answer your question. Well, aside, if that was written by the great god Pan, a shit writer, what a load of bollocks. Hey, she, she continues, okay, she's analysing him now. The actor on the stage, symbolism. Analogies of an actor on the stage are common among occult initiates. They are much older than ROC's conversation with Pan. As a matter of fact, the 1914 issue of The Theosophist carried a similar analogy. In 1914, the Theosophical Society was, as are the occultists of today, engaged in preparing the world to receive their New Age Christ. In 1914, the occultists centred their energies about Krishnamurti, who was slated to become Maitreya the Christ. An article appearing in that magazine entitled Why the World Does Not Understand made it clear that what theosophy was really all about was preparing the world to receive a myth that the underlying actor was always the same. The author said, quote, We are assisting at the preparations for the theatrical makeup of the Christ. To see a theatrical actor from nearby with his face completely plastered with rouge, powder, and lamp black is horrible, and yet the makeup is necessary in order that he may present himself before the footlights. The Christ will make himself up for the centuries to come. To us, his coryphees on the stage of the present. This will perhaps seem anti-aesthetic and repugnant because we shall not understand the necessity for it. And so much the less with the masses will the masses understand it, who, though moving on the same stage, do not take a direct part in the action. The spectators, that is, the future generations, on the contrary, will be totally absorbed in the plot of the drama and will see beauty and depth of expression in what to us seem ridiculous. This is written in 1914. For the moment, the drama which is about to conclude on the stage of the world is still that of some 2,000 years ago, and we scarcely yet understand its plot. The public no longer sees whether the makeup of the represented Christ is a falsification of paint and the play of lights. The actor prepares himself to represent another drama. He will always be the same, and the means for making himself up in a new aspect for a new part will also be the same. Occultists try and seek to serve the actor and do not pay any attention to the paint. The public is interested in the fate of Hamlet and Othello, 
It believes their ad adventures real. It follows them intensely. It hisses and it applauds. But he who has donned the costumes of Hamlet and Othello <clears throat> is not only an actor, but a man who recites in order to move the simple public or to make it laugh, who has a home and lives at quite a distance from the theatre. Let us see to it that he shall obtain a success at the next representation. The public will perhaps applaud the interpreting hero. We shall count on the affection of the artist. Close quotes. It's kind of, it's almost like, um, You know, world servers, re reading all this stuff, waiting for the Christ. It's kind of like, um, something from, um, a John Wyndham novel. Like this population of people all over the world and they're like preparing the way for the Christ to come. Like bringing in some dark spiritual entity. It's really Satan and it's coming in the as the, the Maitreya, it's kind of um, like the Omen, is it the third, the third um, Omen film, where they're waiting for the, the stars are all being aligned and they're all off in, in Italy, they're having that thing and they're um, preparing their way for, for, for the Antichrist or whatever it was, I think it's the third one. Anyway, yeah, she continues. An interesting comparison is the 1914 Theosophical article. Le Mesure's The Armageddon Script and Bryant's Man on the Stage. As Jesus said, there would be deception enough to deceive even the elect. World Vision. Another person I allegedly misunderstood was W. Stanley Mooneyham, the former president of World Vision. When I wrote The Hidden Dangers, I had not completed Mooneyham's What Do You Say to a Hungry World? Had I done so, I would have been even more critical than I had been. The reader should note the following. 1. Mooneyham repeatedly urges people to become change agents. See page 24 and 115 of What Do You Say to a Hungry World? 2. He called for an international Joseph with an international plan. Pages 172 to 173 in What Do You Say to a Hungry World? Quote, Having seen the world at the brink of famine and still standing only a few inches away, an increasing number of voices are joining in a call for a Joseph. It was this far-sighted Prime Minister of ancient Egypt who planned and administered the world's most famous food stockpile. About the only voices which haven't joined in the call for a food stockpiling system today are from the are the community sorry, are the commodity futures spec speculators and members of the Farm Bureau. Recent years have taught us a great deal. And one of the things is that no one nation can carry the burden of feeding the world. Well, it's a little aside, but maybe the nation should just concentrate on feeding itself. That's how nations meant to work, right? And they always did work. And they can work. Sound like a nationalist. Continues. Just as the US dollar can no longer serve as the foundation of an international monetary system, so US agriculture may no longer have sufficient excess capacity to ensure reasonable stability in the world food economy. <laughs> Funny how they're working like for world government bringing it all together when it's quite quite simple from just from that one sentence there that that you know, you have nation states feeding themselves borders and everything. 
works. Thus, the need today is for an international Joseph with an international plan. Emphasis added. Three, repeatedly cited Open New Ages, Lester Brown, E.F. Schumacher, Francis Lappy, Richard J. Barnett, a Lindisfarne Fellow, Club of Rome, Theodore Hesburgh, Alvin Toffler, Paul Elric, Robert Hellbroner, Gandhi. Oh, he repeatedly cited them. Four, standard occult arguments for population control employed on pages 43, 243, 257 and 263. Five, utilises vocabulary of New Age movement, interdependence, celebration, process, turn inward, change agents, global village, fourth world, global wholeness. Six, visualisation references. Seven, obviously favours abortion, sterilisation and birth control. And she quotes him. Given present growth trends, should Americans limit their present families to two children? Exclamation mark. Would that make any difference to the rest of the world? Exclamation mark. To the USA of the future? Exclamation mark. If family limitation seems desirable, what will this mean to our views on sterilisation, abortion and birth control? 8. Mooneyham favours a one world government. On page 215 of What Do You Say to a Hungry World, he quotes Julius Nair of Tanzania with approval. Quote, Unfortunately, there is no world government which would tax the rich nations for the benefit of the poor nations. There is no international equivalent of social security payments. Instead, we have an acknowledgement of the need for international aid. 9. Similar, similarly to the Alice Bailey books and Tibetan predictions, Mooneyham recommends a turning inward combined with revolutionary changes in the present world order. He approvingly quotes Mahbub ul Haq, a senior economic advisor at the World Bank, as follows, quote, The developing countries have no choice but to turn inwards, much the same as communist China, and to adopt a different style of life, seeking a consumption pattern more consistent with their own poverty, pots and pans and bicycles and simple consumption habits without being seduced by the lifestyles of the rich. This requires a redefinition of economic and social objectives, which is of truly staggering proportions, a liquidation of the privileged groups and vested interests, which may well be impossible in many societies, a redistribution of political economic power, which may only be achieved through revolutions rather than through an evolutionary change. This is strong medicine, but he is not the only one prescribing it. Any of this sounding familiar? Great Reset, Klaus Schwab. <clears throat> like Alan Watt used to say, they plan... Not years, but decades, hundreds of years in advance. Ted Engstrom. Nor has world vision been free of problems under Mooneyhan's successor, Ted, Ted Engstrom. He enthusiastically recommends Dennis, we Dennis Waitley's scarcely veiled New Age slash philosophical mind control books, even though those books openly recommend the works of Marilyn Ferguson. Brackets. How is one to blame Marilyn Ferguson when she re receives imprimaturs from such prominent personalities in the Christian world. Close brackets. 
I've never heard of this Dennis Waitley. New Age Philosophical slash Mind Control books. This that sounds interesting. So Georgi Lozanov, Ernest Holmes, and hosts of other influential New Agers. And he did so well after the storm broke over the New Age movement. He also, as do all too many others, recommends the works of self-confessed New Age guru John Naisbitt. World Vision Vice President Ed Dayton praises the Ferguson books and in a footnoted statement to one of his books that would even make a better informed Marilyn Ferguson smile and amusement, he proclaims that certain evangelical writers are in error when the, they connect Marilyn Ferguson with the New Age movement. World Vision of Europe has apparently affiliated itself with New Age organisation Tranet. Only member... Only member organisations are permitted to advertise in their publications and World Vision of Europe does. Tranet is a quarterly newsletter directory distributed regularly only to members. In quotes, regularly only to members. It describes itself as, quote, a quarterly newsletter directory of, by and for people who are participating in transformation. People who are changing the world by changing their own lives. People who are adopt adopting alternative technologies. Close quote. A recent issue carried the following announcement. Quote, the World Vision of Europe resource directory is now available for one sterling slash dollar check. The directory lists important information available to anyone involved in development work in third world countries. Eight different sections cover all aspects of development, including agriculture, health, logistics, development, relief slash disasters slash refugees, water sanitation, recruitment, orientation and technology. Each may be ordered separately. I think this was... <laughs> This was written in 1985, this book. Um, Constance Cumby, she must have been going off a nut when um, when Live Aid was going on. She must have been watching Live Aid like, they're doing it, they're doing it. One world government, they're doing it. Tranet describes itself as a quarterly newsletter directory of, by and for people who are participating in transformation. People who are changing the world by changing their own lives. People who are adopting alternative technologies. This is not to single out Sign, Bryant and Cider. What they are doing is not unusual. This is the evangelical tragedy. Right, what we turn, what's the time been? That's the end of chapter um, 12. How long is this one? I'll get this one in. Chapter 13. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, a patron saint of the New Age movement. A Jesuit priest, priest five times censored by his order for apostasy, laid much of the philosophical groundwork for both the New Age movement and its closely allied cousin, religious apostasy. apostasy. His name was Pierre Telehard de Chardin. Today, as the prophesied apostasy gains momentum, all too often the former tables are reversed. Officially, the pantheistic works of Telehard still stand condemned by a Vatican monitum. However, many times it is the Catholics who express their displeasure at his acceptance, who receive cold treatment from much of the American Catholic leadership. As is the case with Father Matthew Fox, Taylor Hard de Chardin's influence extended far beyond Catholicism. Secularists, mainline Protestants and all too often even professed evangelicals have greeted his work with wild raves of approval. Dr Robert Muller, Assistant Secretary General of the UN, 
speaks proudly of his five te telehardin enlightenments. Jean Houston tells of her childhood memories of Central Park walks with this man. Marilyn Ferguson uses him perhaps more than any other source in the Aquarian conspiracy. Chardin's acceptance has not always been so universal as it is today. He was discredited in the eyes of many for his role in the Piltdown Man scandal. Chardin is a known source of controversy between conservative and liberal Roman Catholics. Lately, he has become one between evangelical and neo-evangelical Protestants as well. His brand of pantheism has become extremely attractive to the ecological creation-centred spirituality. Jeremy Rifkin following evangelicals. Many of them have embraced Chardin with an enthusiasm that would make even liberal Catholics blush. Chardin was a distant relative of Voltaire. And in many ways he stands in the same relationship to the New Age movement as Voltaire does to humanism. World Books of Waco, Texas was one evangelical publisher who helped to popularise Chardin. They have a lengthy series dedicated to the, quote, makers of the modern theological mind, unquote. Reading it, one is reminded of the boasts of the Ecum Ecumenical Institute. Quote, 97, seldom in the past, I think that's page 97, seldom in the past has there been so profound a recovery of the theological heritage of the people of God. Though much reflection is needed, this basic task of recovery is accomplished. The work of the theological giants of the 20th century theological revolution stands as a body of thought never to be divided as the object of debate where theologian is set against theologian. This work stands in its totality as a self-understanding to be appropriated and lived out in which each theologian offers a unique contribution to the whole. End quote. The Ecumenical Institute also idolises Chardin. That organisation is known by two other primary aliases, including the Order, Ecumenical and the Institute for Cultural Affairs. Their 1967 The Declaration of the spirit mo movement of the people of God, century 20, close brackets, is reprinted in its entirety in the appendix to this book. Oh, that might be quite interesting. The Declaration of the Spirit Movement of the People of God, century 20. The author of the World Books volume dealing with Chardin is Doran McCarty, a Kansas, City, a Kansas City Baptist Seminary professor. Reporting is one thing, I suppose, but McCarty's writings far exceed simple reporting. He wrote about Chardin with a zeal that would seem commendable to any liberal, Catholic or New Ager. The Calvin College Fellows appear to be strongly influenced by Chardin as well. In their book, Earthkeeping, they say, quote, On an even more exalted level is the opinion of a Christian thinker, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Teilhard writes glowingly of this sudden deluge of cerebralisation. Sorry, cerebralization. This biological invasion of a new animal type which gradually eliminates or subjects all form of life that are not human. This irresistible tide of fields and factories, this immense and growing edifice of matter and ideas. All these signs proclaim that there has been a change on the earth and a change of planetary magnitude. Bloody hell, that's um, 
I just saw it. Let's read that again. He writes glowingly of this sudden deluge of cerebralization, this biological invasion of a new animal type which gradually eliminates or subjects all forms of life that are not human, this irresistible tide of fields and factories, this immense and growing edifice of matter and ideas. All these signs proclaim that there has been a change on the earth and a change of planetary magnitude. Okay, I think what he's getting at is um, um, he's kind of dissing humanity, saying that humanity's kind of out of control. And um, I guess he's that's kind of Christianity's fault. Like, like, like the, a lot of people have got the idea that in the Bible, um, in Genesis, where it said you have dominion over the, or the what's it, the the fields and the fish, the, the fowl of the air and the fishes of the sea, that they they construe that, a lot of our New Ages or environmentalists, they construe that as being um, man giving a license to rape the earth. Um, and a lot of people say, Jay Dyer's always talking about it, that it's a big, it's a misinterpretation. And it's, it's it was... God saying that man had to be the, like the, the, um, what's the word, like, like, like the caretaker of the earth. But there's this, like I said earlier, um, a while ago in the other video, they can see the same, same two pieces of information, or one piece of information, but people will have completely different interpretations of it. Anyway, I'm getting... And Tyler Hard goes on to speak with hope of a time when the Earth shall become a solid sphere of hominized substance. Maybe I'm misinterpreting, misinterpreting that. She, close quote, she continues. Chardin may be tame material for at least one of those Calvin College authors. Calvin DeWitt, who is a co-laborer with Dominican priest Matthew Fox in the field of creation-centred spirituality. And even in the strongest bastions of the Catholic conservatism, there have been occasional forays of Chardin infection. Heartbreakingly, one included Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, saying Chardin was, quote, faithful to his priesthood and his faith. He strongly suggested Chardin should be canonised. There's a quote. As one looks at the various trends in our day, one sees that Tyler Hard's conception of spirituality is in the forefront. He knew that he had to pass through many hazards, but his was directed principally to the cosmic world. Others have been directed to the human world. This does not mean to say that Tyler Hard limited himself to anthropology and physics. His fundamental orientation was, quote, to attain heaven through the fulfilment of earth, Christify matter, Christify matter, Christify matter. It is very likely that within 50 years, when all the trivial verbal disputes about the meaning of Tyler Hard's unfortunate vocabulary will have died away or have taken a secondary place. Taylor Hard will appear like John of the Cross and Saint Teresa of Avila as the spiritual genius of the 20th century. And that's from a quote from Reverend Fulton J. Sheen, Footprints in a Darkened Forest, Meredith Press, New York, 1967, Chapter 6, The Origins of Man in Society. 
End of quote. She, she continues. Romans 1.25 spoke of those, quote, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, close quotes. Chardin greatly helped to intensify the trend of those doing just that in the 20th century. Thousands of New Agers and Christian apostates have adopted his work as a foundation for their own heresies. And Father Matthew Fox, OP, a Dominican priest, has now brought it full circle. They are clearly bringing us a different gospel with a different Jesus. Chardin's cosmic Christ rather than Jesus Christ. As such, we must take Paul's advice to let them be anathema. From uh, Galatians 1.8. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I just want to find... Um, Where was it? Oh God, I've lost it. Hold on. I think this is it. Da, 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 da. Yeah, this thing here. Appendix G. The new group of world servers Tara sent a brochure. Let's have a look at this. She quoted it from, I can't find the bit she quoted it from back there, 248. Let's have a look at this. There we go. She's, it's reprint as well. Lee, look at this. The new group of world servers. Victor Hugo prophesied that in the 20th century, war would die, frontier boundaries would die, dogma would die, and man would live. This is like a leaflet that, from the 80s. He will possess something higher than these, a great country, the whole earth, and a great hope, the whole heaven, from the Aquarian Conspiracy. The new group of world servers... In the year 1925, a small group of people whose lives were dedicated to practical brotherhood, an international spirit of goodwill will, and a sensitivity to the energies and keynotes of the dawning Aquarian age, emerged into the world. This is the new group of world servers. A group without apparent outward organisation, but which now has in its ranks Millions of men and women. They are the citizens of the borderless country that Hugo calls the whole earth. It is these light bearers who have within themselves the answers to the problems which humanity faces today and who are now working in every field of human endeavour to build a new planetary civilization, the kingdom of God on earth. Members of the new group of world servers may be found in every nation and are of every race and school of thought. It's kind of, it's kind of, imagine sort of, you've got this on a leaflet and you're sort of you're smoking a spliff or having a beer like at some festival in the 80s, like reading this thing, kind of going in your soft head. I'm a world server, I want to be a world server. 
world server characteristics. This is like I haven't read this. Let's put my let's put a bet on it. <laughs> I don't bet. This is going to be grooming, right? This is going to be psychological grooming. World server characteristics, and there's like a little pyramid. Where is it? There. Little kind of pyramid. Uh, three things in a pyramid in a circle. World server characteristics. They are free from critical spirit and a feeling of separatedness, a separateness. They hold to no creed except brotherhood based on the one life and serve no master except the group they seek to serve and humanity whom they deeply love. They belong to no particular religion but accord equal devotion to the spiritual leaders of all races. They are willing to work behind the scenes without out outward recognition while relying mainly on intuition for guidance, like invasion of the body snatchers. They consider old methods of fighting, attacks and partisanship as undesirable. They recognise no authority except that of their own souls. They seek to maintain a balance between outer and inner activities. They are free from the taint of ambition and pride of race or accomplishment Oh, they're just so laid back, their brains are falling out. They achieve their aims by example, backed by sacrifice and love. It's grooming. They recognise and support all other groups which work for understanding, synthesis and unity. Code of conduct for world servers. Harm no one. Desire nothing for the separated self and see the divinity in all. Regard no race or nation as more important than any other. I should have imagined, imagine, John Lennon imagined playing in the background. Ignore racial hatreds, religious differences and national ambitions. Just, just. <laughs> Do not put undue emphasis on the organisation aspect. The new group of world servers is an organism, not an organisation. Members should not identify themselves or the group with any political, religious or social propaganda. Spread love and light instead of resisting evil. Do not dissipate your efforts on unimportant work. Speak or publish no word which would evoke antagonism from any group. Only principles of universal application need be expressed. Maintain a life of meditation. Do not interfere with any political or religious group. So it's, it's subversive. The purpose of this brochure is to bring the ideals and objectives of the new group of world servers to the attention of the general public and to reach the disciples, aspirants and men and women of goodwill who may not be consciously aware of their connection with this group. Like, so you, you, you could be a world server, but you don't even know it. And like, especially young people, how many people they grow up, they think, oh, they're going to be a pop star or a famous actor. They think everyone, you know, everyone's like this. They think that they're, they're special or they've got to prove themselves. They wake up, oh, oh, I always thought I was special. I always thought I was special. Now I realise why. Now I realise why. It's because I'm a world server. I'm a world server. That's I, I always knew there was something special about me. I always knew there was something different about me. And this is, I'm a world server. This It's manipulative. Very clever and very manipulative. Let this information help awaken them to their true mission and awaken their interest in the plan the new group of world servers and the reappearance of the Christ and the masters of wisdom. And again, it's got that little um, thing there. And this is... 
this this looks like, it looks like some kind of prayer. <coughs> <coughs> May the powers of the one life pour through the group of all true servers. May the love of the one soul characterise the life of all who seek to aid the great ones. Or the elder gods. H.P. Lovecraft's elder gods. Manipulating humanity. May we fulfil our part in the one work through self-forgetfulness, harmlessness and right speech. Uh, that mantra of the new group of world servers, mantra, it's like their prayer. And it says, this brochure is based on the Alice Bailey teachings. I guess she's put that in. Uh -um. Ideals. They believe in an inner world government and an emerging evolutionary plan. Oh, this is her writing now. Oh, no, no, no. They are steadily cultivating an international spirit of goodwill. This is the brochure. They seek to teach that there are many national religious and social experiments in the world. Some aspects of these have a definite place and purpose in the new age. Some are undesirable because they spot spread the virus of hatred and separation. Objectives. Bring about world peace, guide world destiny, and usher in the new age. Form the vanguard for the reappearance of the Christ and his great disciples, the masters of wisdom. Advocate the fair distribution of planetary resources. Ah, oh, getting, getting a little bit political. Advocate the fair distribution of planetary resources so that every man, woman and child has adequate food, shelter and clothing. Great reset. Eliminate fear in the world. Provide a centre of light within humanity and hold the vision of the divine plan before mankind. Form a bridge between humanity and the kingdom of God. Raise the level of human consciousness. Cultivate a planetary spirit of goodwill. Raise the level of human consciousness. Can't you just leave people alone? Can't you just let a bloke have a job, work, have a family, enjoy a beer and scratch his ass, bother him with raising his level of consciousness? Recognise and change those aspects of religion and government which delay the full manifestation of planetary unity and love. See, recognise and change those aspects of religion and government. See, earlier on it said, do not interfere with any political or religious group. And then it's um, recognise and change those aspects of religion and government which delay the full manifestation of planetary unity and love. So I guess it means do not... Um, do not interfere um, outwardly, but inwardly, you're a change agent. Subversion. Yuri Bezmenov. Sub I've got the, the spectre of Yuri Bezmenov. Um, yeah. Embody constructive forces so as to balance the forces of destruction and disintegration now present in the world. Consciously participate in the three major full moon festivals, Easter, Aries, Wesak, Taurus, and the Festival of the Goodwill, Gemini. In addition to the remaining minor full moon observances, I've never heard of the, these three full moon festivals. Maybe other people know about it. I've never heard of this. Maybe it was an idea that didn't, just didn't catch on. Connect world governments with a unity of purpose. And then you've got your little thing there again. Um, what's that thing they have in America? Kwanzaa, which is just like a, a, a sort of nondescript, uh, non-partial religious festival. Maybe it's something, an idea like Kwanzaa, but um, like maybe it didn't 
maybe it didn't catch on. Connect world governments with a unity of purpose. And, from, and they put on the leaflet, these are the books that they cited on the leaflet to go and read for more information. The Aquarian Conspiracy, Marilyn Ferguson. Esoteric Psychology, Volume 2 by Alice Bailey. Full Moon Story, Arcana Workshop, Ramsdale Press, 1967. The Hierarchy and the Plan by H. Sarah Darian. Messages from Maitreya. Tara Center, ponder on this and serving humanity, both compiled from the writing of Alice A. Bailey, Lucy's publishing, publishing, the reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom of Benjamin Crane, and at the bottom, at the end of the pamphlet, yet yeah, the end of the pamphlet, which is reprinted here. Um, they've got the Great Invocation, which is um, the Great Invocation. It's basically like a sort of New Age version of like the Lord's Prayer. Um, the Great Invocation. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. <clears throat> From the centre where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men. The purpose which the masters know and serve. From the centre which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out. And may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. That's the end of that, um, that appendix. New group of world servers. Great invocation. Just reminds me of when I was a kid in bed at night on my little transistor radio. I used to listen, listen to um, Radio Caroline. And they used to have a jingle. And it said, Radio Caroline's radio station on a boat. In, just off from where I lived actually in Clacton, in Essex. And they had a jingle because it was on a boat. And it said, from a point at sea to the circles in your mind, this is the new Caroline. <laughs> Which reminds me of that. And they were all hippies on that boat. Is that film, The Boat That Rocked, which I've never watched because it just looks so bad. 